Um, I'm Librarian Kate Raleigh. Welcome to the NOAA Central Library. Um, we're excited to have you here for the Canals Fellows um, Brown Bag Series. Today we have Bianca Santos, who's doing Frank and Turtles, the Science Behind the Monsters. Bianca is a 2018 Sea Grant uh, Canals Fellow at the NOAA OAR International Activities Office. She graduated with a BS in Marine Vertebrate Biology from Stony Brook University in 2014 and recently completed her MS in Marine Science with concentration in fisheries science and marine policy at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, please join me in welcoming her and her topic. So thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about the research I conducted as a graduate student on sea turtle mortality in the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm also gonna be talking about my Franken turtles, which you may or may not have heard of, but I will get to in detail. So sea turtles are highly migratory and long-lived species found around the globe. There are seven species of sea turtles found worldwide, of which six of them are found in US, state water, US coastal waters. Of those, the loggerhead sea turtle is the most common sea turtle species found here in the United States. Unfortunately, sea turtles are globally threatened by a number of processes, and these include things such as habitat destruction, climate change, and fisheries bycatch. Interactions with commercial fishing activity is noted to be among the top sources of anthropogenic sea turtle mortality in the coastal U.S. And given the endangered and threatened status of sea turtle species worldwide, a better understanding of the threats sea turtle populations face is really crucial to the long-term sustainability of these populations. So my research really focus, focused in on sea turtles in Virginia. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay is actually a pretty significant foraging and developmental habitat for thousands of sea turtles that use bay water seasonally. There's somewhere, we find somewhere between 5,000 to 20,000 turtles each year inside the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, turtles are seasonal residents of the bay, as you can see by the figure on the bottom right showing their migration patterns. Turtles enter the bay when water temperatures rise around May, feed in the area, and then exit the bay when temperatures drop around September. Here in the Chesapeake Bay, we get primarily juvenile loggerheads, although other species such as greens or Kemp's ridleys are also present. And while they're in the bay, they're primarily feeding on benthic prey, such as horseshoe crabs and blue crabs. So unfortunately, because we have sea turtles in the bay, we also have strandings in the bay. So a sea turtle stranding, if you do not know, is a marine turtle that's found washed up, floating at, washed up on the coastline or floating at sea, either deceased or oftentimes severely injured. NOAA established a sea turtle stranding and salvage network in the 1980s to help document these strandings. And it's a combination of a federal, state, and private partnership that documents strandings from 18 states from Maine to Texas, including parts of the U.S. Caribbean. And essentially how it works is each state or region gets a stranding coordinator who's responsible for documenting strandings in that, in that area. So not only do they collect data on dead turtles, but they may also rescue any live turtles they find, rehabilitate them, and if they're able to, they'll release them into the wild. So sea turtle strandings provide a really unique opportunity to better understand drivers of sea turtle mortality. Necropsies are typically performed on the dead turtles to try and figure out what went wrong and what caused their death. However, in general, determining cause of mortality can be really challenging. And this is due to a combination of the state of carcass decomposition. A lot of the times the turtle is simply too decayed when it's found and too mushy on the inside to really figure out what went wrong. And also a general lack of physical evidence. There's not only always that smoking gun of a balloon stuck in its esophagus, for example. In particular, research has shown that interactions with certain types of fishing gear do not always leave marks on turtles. And this is due to a combination of gear types, such as the soft nets, as well as sea turtle anatomy, namely the hard carapace on its back, which makes it resistant to marks from certain types of fishing gear. Research has also shown that solely using in injuries noted at time of stranding to try and attribute cause of death can grossly underestimate fisheries-induced mortality. So in Virginia, my research really focused in on that subset of dead sea turtles found stranded on a coastline, which was the vast majority of them. We get somewhere between 100 to 300 strandings per year, 
As you can see by this distribution showing stranding events on the bottom right, this shows the distribution of stranding events in the Bay from 2001 to 2014. Over this 14 time period, 14 year time period, we had over 3,800 strandings. Greens represents a low number of stranding events and the reds and oranges represent a higher number of strandings. So as you can see, strandings are pretty widespread throughout the entire bay, but there tends to be a concentration right around the entrance to the bay mouth, noted by the red and yellow. Although strandings can occur throughout their turtle's entire summer residency in the bay, there tends to be a peak in strandings right around late May and early June when turtles are first entering the bay. And these strandings are a conservation concerns for a number of reasons. So 100 to 300 turtles out of 5,000 to 20,000 might not seem like a lot, but it is, and it's a concern. And this is because these strandings are likely a minimal estimate of actual at sea mortality, because not all dead sea turtles are gonna strand. Some might get washed out to sea, some might get eaten, some might sink. Some studies estimate that strandings only represent 10 to 20% of actual at sea mortality. And furthermore, the turtles we see in the Chesapeake Bay are this critical large juvenile life stage. They've already overcome the worst years of their lives. They're at this teenager level and they have to survive just a few years longer until they reach reproductive maturity. And once they reach reproductive maturity, they can start contributing to future populations. Therefore, significant mortality at this level can have really detrimental impacts. So in Virginia, the stranding center is associated with the Virginia Aquarium down in Virginia Beach. Necropsies are performed on those dead turtles, but the cause of mortality for all strandings in Virginia is largely unknown. And this is predominantly due that most of the carcasses are found in this really severe decomposition state. Nonetheless, of the necropsies that we are able to figure out a cause of death, the majority of turtles exhibit evidence of death by either vessel strike or they're classified as no apparent injuries. And no apparent injuries is a category where research suggests it could potentially be due to fisheries interactions. And that's because these turtles are relatively healthy prior to death, suggesting that they're not already predisposed, predisposed, predisposed or weakened in any way prior to mortality. They also have a general lack of external wounds, which goes back to my earlier statement about how fishing nets and other gear types don't always leave marks. And these are turtles that are found with fin fish in their stomach. So naturally, turtles are not believed to be agile enough to consume fish naturally. So the presence of fish in their stomachs suggests that they might be feeding from fisheries bycatch or foraging in nets, both of which put them in close proximity to fishing gear. So there's a number of fishing gear in Virginia that have had documented interactions with sea turtles. And that includes gears such as pow nets, gill nets, pots and traps, and hull seine. The Menhaden and purse seine fishery has not been implemented in takes in Chesapeake Bay specifically, but they have been impl implemented in, in sea turtle takes in other parts around the world. Which leads me to the overall purpose of my research, which is to determine locations and drivers of sea turtle mortality in the Chesapeake Bay. So based on stranding records, we know where turtles are washing up, but this remains the question as to where they're dying at sea. Because if we can figure out where they're dying at sea, we can figure out why they're dying at sea by looking at things going on in those areas. So in order to understand my research, it's kind of important to understand what exactly happens when a sea turtle dies, which is something that you may not think about every day. So when a sea turtle dies, the first thing that happens is that the carcass will sink to the bottom of the seafloor. After a certain amount of time, decomposition processes, processes will kick in, causing the body to bloat and float up to the surface, becoming buoyant. At this point, the turtle acts as a drifting object, moving with both currents and winds. And if conditions are right, they'll strand up upon, up upon the coastline. But the key takeaway here is that turtle carcasses act as drifting objects. And we have the ability to use forecast models to predict the trajectories of drifting objects if we know their drift characteristics. And this is really similar to how search and rescue operations look for missing boats or missing persons at sea, same concept. So what we're trying to do is create a model based on where turtles strand, backtrack to figure out where they died at sea. So the core of my research is the development of this oceanographic model. And how it works, I'm just gonna run you through a schematic version so we randomly release in the bay thousands of these current tracking pseudoparticles all on the computer. We track them forward in time for a period of time until they land on the shore. We then focus in on particles that landed in areas where we see sea turtle strandings. And we can look back at the drift, 
trajectory pathway to see where those particles came from. But the first question that comes up is how far back in this drift trajectory pathway do you want to go? A turtle that's been dead and drifting for one day might come from someplace very differently than a turtle that's been drifting for 10 days. So my first research objective was to figure out how long have turtles been drifting after death. The second thing I wanted to look at was the relationship between currents and winds. So a buoyant sea turtle carcass on the surface of the water is moved by both currents and winds, and I needed to better understand what that relationship was. Once I have those drift parameters all set, I can then rerun my model with the parameters of an actual drifting sea turtle carcass. And then finally, focus in on predicted areas of sea turtle mortality and looking at things going on in those areas. So for my presentation today, I'm just going to briefly touch upon each of these four objectives. <coughs> so the first one is the estimation of ocean drift time. So one of the pieces of information that stranding centers collect when responding to a dead sea turtle stranding is this condition code. And this is a number from zero to five. It's based on a qualitative assessment of how decayed the carcass is. And this is important for me because how decayed the carcass is signifies how long ago since death has occurred. So what I was interested in doing was associating a time component with this scale. So to do that, I performed a decay rate study where I tethered fresh dead turtles in a near coastal habitat uh, right, by, right in Virginia. And I pretty much checked on them every day to see how long it took them to, to decay through this condition code continuum. So the next slide is a little gory, but not too gory. So these are the results of just one of my turtle. It's not that bad, I promise. So this is what it started with. It was a 70-pound loggerhead, and he started on day zero as a code one, so he was fresh dead. After just two days of being in the water, he decayed to a code two, uh, which is slightly decayed. And the characteristic for that is that the slight bloating that you can see that caused it to become buoyant. Two days later, at code four, it was a code three, which is moderately decomposed, and that's characterized by the large gaping holes that you can see in it. And then finally, <coughs> by just eight days later, it became a code five, so just bones. And this was very surprising for me, because he started as a 70-pound loggerhead. I didn't really think he'd decay this fast, but it did. <laughs> and I did this for, um, I repeated this for eight different times for eight different turtles, and of different sizes and different species, and they were all on pretty similar um, time scales. So the key takeaway from this drift study was, or this decay study, is the concept of buoyancy time. So all of my turtles were only buoyant for a certain amount of time until decay happened, and they started the body started to rip apart, causing these gases to be released and it to sink to the bottom of the seafloor. And this suggests that this buoyancy time is maximum drift time because turtles can only drift if they're buoyant at the water surface. Interestingly, in all eight of my trials, it was during code three when this happened, when the turtles were too decayed and no longer were buoyant. This suggests that turtles that are found in condition codes four and five must have stranded a long time prior to discovery and that additional decay occurred on land. Temperature was found to be statistically significant to both time to total decay, which is in the triangles, as well as this duration of positive buoyancy in the circles. And this isn't very surprising because in colder water temperatures, decay happens slower. So essentially, cold temperatures are increasing buoyancy time. And this led me to start to think that perhaps this could explain that spring peak and strandings that I talk about. So historically, we get nearly 50% of all annual strandings occurring during this two to three week period around late May. And this is thought to be that there's elevated mortality during this time period. But maybe there's not actually elevated mortality. Mortality levels are constant, but during the summer, things are decaying at a faster rate, so they're not stranding as much. So that was my first sort of objective, was characterizing how long since turtles had died. My second one is to look at the impact of wind forcing. So a sea turtle carcass point on the water surface is partially submerged, so it makes it susceptible to movements by both currents from below and wind from above. So I want to better understand what that relationship is. To do that, I did a drift release study where I released different types of surface drifters. This included bucket drifters, which are just inverted five-gallon buckets with a GPS tag on top, and they move entirely with currents, only sticking out a couple inches for the GPS tag. Also, these cute wood styrofoam turtles which are built with the same shape and dimension as actual loggerhead sea turtles in the bay. 
and they have the character characteristic sea turtle carapace that sticks out of the water, causing them to move with both currents and winds. And then finally, my franken turtles are my true turtle carcasses that are actual sea turtle carcasses reconstructed. GPS tag was placed on them, and they move with both currents and winds as well. So I know everyone's wondering how you can make a franken turtle and how you can go home and make your own. So I just wanted to walk you through the process of how we created them. So this is an image of one of my franken turtles. We have the carapace side on the left and the plastron side on the right. And essentially we received these carcasses from the stranding center. So these are stranded turtles that were necropsies and completely gutted. So we had the carapace side that had the carapace and all the heads and flippers attached. And then we had the plastron side and the plastron was removable, so leaving us with a big empty body cavity that was already emptied out before we got it. So what we did is we removed the plastron side, revealing just the empty ca body cavity. We filled the body cavity with this insulating foam, which is essentially that plumber's foam that you could spray out and it gets hard and it grows. So we filled that all inside the body cavity. We then put the plastron back on top and we drilled holes with this big heavy duty drill bit all around the plastron and carapace side of the sea turtle. We also created a big hole on the carapace side for the GPS tag. So one of the questions or one of the issues we ran into was how we were going to attach a GPS to our franken turtles. Uh, we were originally going to put it on the top of the turtle, but the GPS needs to be facing the sky for the GPS signal to emit. So the idea was if the turtle turns around in the water, it won't always be forward facing. So instead I constructed the self-writing buoy that had the GPS on it. It was just a crab buoy with a two pound weight on one side, GPS on the other side, and it was attached to the turtle, allowing the turtle to do whatever it wanted, but the GPS would always be facing the sky. So once that was attached, we then used just heavy duty zip ties all the way around to connect the two parts. And we didn't, weren't too confident that that was gonna hold. So we also at the end for extra reinforcement added this wire mesh just to keep everything in place. And it worked surprisingly well. This is the side profile. So you have my little Franken turtle Oreo on the left hand side, and then the actual Franken turtle on the right. You can see it drifts at about mid level, which is what normal sea turtle carcasses would drift at. And you may or may not have heard about my Franken turtles because I got a lot of press interest in it, which is really cool. It just started with the media office at my school caught wind and asked if they can come and invite a local newspaper to come for one of our releases. And then they published a story and it got huge and it sort of blew up. And the most notable notable ones, I would say, was being interviewed by the Washington Press. And then I was also on NPR Science Friday, which is super cool. And it was really awesome because it also raised a lot of awareness about the issue. So it got people talking, which is really great. And that was in 2016. And I feel like here we are today, people still recognize me as Frank and Turner. <laughs> So this is this is an example of what our drifter release is like. This is an example right after we released one of them. So we have the buckets on the left, with, which only move with currents. And then we have our franken turtle, as well as our actual turtles, which move with currents and winds. And the idea is by releasing them in the same area and watching as they diverge away from one another, you can assess what the component of wind is by seeing the difference between their drift trajectories. So this is an example of one of those drift release trials. So the star is where we deployed them. We deployed all the objects together in the center of the bay. These two green lines represent the, the trajectories of the two bucket drifters. We then had two wooden drifters as two wood turtle drifters as well, represented by these red lines. And then finally, two franken turtles represented by the blue lines. So as you can see, things get pretty crazy, but in this drift release trial, everything just pretty much went straight up into the mob jack and everything beached within two to three days. And we're not really interested in all this chaoticness, which the mo what is most interesting and most useful for our purposes was the first six to 12 hours. And that's because if you focus in just on that, you can start to see the clear separation of objects as they move away from one another. So we have the two buckets in green, which pretty much were right on top of each other. And then we have the two franken turtles in blue and the two wood turtles in orange and red, which matched up pretty well and moved differently away from the buckets. So this is what we are interested in. And we did this drift release trial four times at different parts of the bay, different times throughout the summer. And then we did a wind leeway analysis to estimate this wind component. And we were able to estimate that you wanna add one to 4% of winds to currents to account for how a sea turtle drifts. 
So that was the bulk of my experimental work. And if you're at all interested in reading more about it, my publication on it just came out earlier this year. And experimental work was a combination of the decay rate study, determining how long since death occurred, and the drift release study, which characterized how a turtle drifts. And both of these feed into the second part of my study, which was the actual computer modeling to predict these mortality locations. So just to run you through how it goes again, the basic strategy is to repeatedly release throughout the bay thousands of these particles. I then track them forward in time for a period of time based on the results of the decay study. And then finally, I identify particles that land in the right place at the right time. And I look back at the drift trajectory pathway to see where they came from. So before I get into the details of that, I just want to briefly talk about the stranding data I used. I ended up using a six-year time period between 2009 and 2014. There was a number of assumptions we had to make, so we had to narrow down our stranding data to meet this criteria. And that includes we wanted the turtles to be buoyant and free-floating, so we limited the stranding data to only those turtles found in condition codes 1 to 3. And that was due to my earlier work, which suggests that turtles can only float and be buoyant until condition code three, after which point that additional decay might occur on land. Related to this assumption was the idea that strandings have to be reported in a timely manner. And that was also the decrease in certainty and decay processes, processes on land. So to meet that, we narrowed it in to strandings that occur along the coastlines of highly populated areas. And in this case, that included the bay side of Northampton County, represented by the one, Northampton County represented by the two, and Virginia Beach County represented by three. We omitted the ocean side of Northampton County because it's largely barrier islands, so this assumption probably does not hold true. And then finally, we only focused in on those strandings that occur during the spring and summertime because that's when turtles are resident in the bay. So this is an example of how the model works. So right here, that purple dot is the stranding location of actual loggerhead sea turtle. And we created this buffer around it, which is that um, purple circle. So I randomly released throughout the bay on the computer, not real life this mm -hmm. time, thousands of these particles. Mm -hmm. I tracked them forward in time based on current and wind information. But then I focused in only on those particles that ended up in that purple zone. So if you take away all the other noise, you can start to see clear areas where those particles came from. So here you have the green dot, which represents the particle origin the black line, which is the trajectory, and then the red dot, which is the ending point inside that circle. So this is just one release. But if we do that many, many times over many, many of releases, you start to get a probability dis distribution that forms. So this probability distribution shows the likelihood of particle origin for all particles that ended up in that zone at the right time. So this was just one stranding but we did this many times over many strandings over that six year period. And essentially what we wanted to do was group individual strandings together in different analyses to reduce individual variability between them. So the analyses that we looked at included those turtles that died during the spring peak as well as the non-peak period. We also separated turtle by probable cause of death, which included vessel strikes, no apparent injuries, and then this unable to assess category, which was the most sort of vague, but it's just turtles that no necropsy was performed, an unqualified observer responded, things like that. And the remaining of the strandings were omitted just due to low sample size and diversity of causes. We also looked at average drift time and distances over the stranding season. So the first subset of turtles results that I'm gonna talk about are the vessel strikes. And this is a really important group because we know it caused their death, and that's death by vessel strikes, and we have a pretty good idea of boating data. So essentially, if our model is a good predictor, the predicted mortality locations of these turtles should align pretty well with where we see lots of boating activity in the bay. So this is the boating data for that 2009-2014 time period. It's just AIS data that's pretty readily accessible online. Similar to all the maps I'm gonna show you moving forward, the blue represents low density and the reds and the oranges represent higher density. So here you can see that there's high boating density around numerous ports of the bay, as well as the clear shipping channel right down the middle. I then moved on to my stranding data. So this is just the subset of vessel strike sea turtle strandings that meet all of our criteria. I buffered them. 
and then I ran my model forward in time, similar to how I walked you through before. And these are the results. So this shows the predicted mortality location of vessel strike turtles. So essentially where we think these turtles are dying at, at sea, which is very strongly concentrated in the lower part of the bay, including the entrance to the James River, Norfolk County, and Virginia Beach Oceanfront. So now we have the model results and we have the bolt results and we can combine the two. And when we do that, we get a joint probability distribution. So what this map shows is the joint probability that both a turtle died there and there was high uh, vessel activity. And as you can see, there's this hot spot that's identified right in the lower part of the bay. So overall, my vessel data shows that my model is a pretty good predictor. We also did some statistics on it, uh, Monte Carlo analysis to further explore how accurate the model might be. I don't really get into it here, but read my paper if you want to know more. But there were some limitations of the data that we had to consider. And this is the fact that AIS is only legally required for certain vessel types, including larger commercial vessels. So smaller commercial vessels and recreational vessels are both unaccounted for. Additionally, US government vessels are exempt by, from AIS reporting requirements. And here in the Chesapeake Bay, we have a significant number of government vessel ports noted by the red circles. And we also have the Norfolk Naval Base, which is the largest naval base in the country. So <coughs> overall, the AIS data we've been using may be underrepresenting actual vessel activity in the bay. But it's the best we have, so it's what we used. So now moving forward to the no apparent injuries, which again is a group of turtles that, that suggests potential fisheries induced mortality. Uh, the fishing data we used was from the VMRC fishing data harvest. Unfortunately, what we really wanted was really fine scale data. As fine scale as possible would be ideal. Um, due to confidentiality, that didn't really happen and all they could provide us with was data on a waterway level, which is represented the domains by these red lines here. Uh, as you can see, they're pretty broad, so not exactly the most useful, not ideal. Um, the other concern we had is that we really wanted data on a month basis or a year basis, but all they could provide us with was one sum of six years of harvest data. So not the best. But we got data on gill nets, pots and traps, pulsane, and pow nets, all which have had documented interactions with sea turtles in the past. This is an example of what that data looks like on the waterway level, so it's pretty broad. For two of the fixed gear types, including staked gill nets and pound nets, we were able to get fine scale data, and this is what that looks like. So it's obviously a lot better and a lot more precise than the other data. And then finally, the Menhaden Persane fishery, which we really wanted to get data for, but here in the Chesapeake Bay, there's only one corporation, Omega Protein, that's in charge of the Menhaden Persane fishery. So VMRC did not have that data. We contacted Omega to see if we can get the data from them, but due to fear of negative repercussion on the industry and confidentiality, we couldn't get that either. So instead, we were limited to the stock, the per same set locations and the stock assessment, which is this map here, which just shows presence absence. And it pretty much encompasses the entire bay. So even more not useful, but it was the best we had, so that's what we used. So these are the results of my turtle, of the predicted mortality locations for these subsets of, tur of turtles. So I have the spring peak is gonna be the row on the top and the non-peak periods on the bottom. First, we have the code ones. The stranding locations are represented by the black dots and then the density maps are represented by the colors. For code ones, predicted mortality locations were typically very close to stranding sites. And in general, we had a really low sample size of code ones, so we couldn't really say much about it. For code two, you can see during the spring peak period, there's a large mortal predicted mortality location right in the James River versus the non-peak period, it moves this predicted concentration moves to the bay set of Northampton. For code threes, during the peak period, there's a predicted mortality in this band right across the lower bay. And the non-peak period is pretty similar to code two, but just more dispersed. Lastly are the results from the unable to assess category. Code one was really low sample size. We only had one turtle. Code two, during the spring peak, there's predicted mortality to occur in the lower parts of the bay. And then during the non-peak period, it also seems to band right across the lower bay. 
And the Code 3 counterparts were pretty similar to Code 2, but just a lot more dispersed in nature. So putting all of these results together, we can identify clear, consistent areas of predicted sea turtle mortality. And that includes one region in the lower James River, highlighted by this red box, and then a second region in the bay side of Northampton, highlighted by this orange box. So now that we've identified these two general areas where we predict sea turtle mortality is occurring, we can look at what's going on in these areas to try and attribute to cause of mortality. So I'm going to start with fishing gear that have a large overlap. And what I mean by large overlap is I mean they have significant fisheries activity in both of these two identified areas. So the first is the sink anchored gillnets. And the hazard with these gillnets is particularly in the larger mesh sizes, greater than 10 centimeters, because it makes it easier for turtles to get entangled in them. Crab pots and traps, where the hazard is in the vertical line connecting the pot to the buoy, can also cause entanglement. And the purse stain fishery also causes entanglement and drowning. So all three of these uh, fishing gear types have large overlap between their activity and sea turtle mortality locations. So it's possible that they're contributing to sea turtle deaths to some degree. The fishing gears with moderate overlap include the hull stain, which is fished primarily in the southwest quadrant of the Chesapeake Bay, and drift gill nets, which have high elevated activity on that bay side of Northampton coast. And then finally, those fishing gears with little overlap that we decided do not significantly play a role in sea turtle deaths incur well include whelk pots and traps, which are fished primarily offshore, staked gill nets, which occur mostly in the upper bay and up tributaries, and pound nets. Although there is significant pound net activity right around that Northampton area, uh, there's been a number of regulations in the pound net fishery in the last 10 years, specifically to reduce turtle mortality, and research shows that pound nets are no longer a significant source. So there's a number of data limitations with the fishing data that we had to think about as we were looking through our results. Somewhat unusually, doesn't really happen in science, our ability to model the biology, meaning our stranding predicted mortality locations, exceeded our ability to quantitatively assess these results with actual fishing data. So we had this fishing data out there, but it just wasn't available to us. So we weren't able to do as detailed comparisons as we would have liked. We did have detailed information on vessel strikes, which was really good because that helped us to do these quantitative assessments. But we had really low resolution of the fishing data. And then we even found out through talking to BMRC representatives that little of the spatio-temporal information is actually currently being collected on some fisheries. Furthermore, VMRC data was not accessible on a month-year basis, so we were stuck using that lump sum of six years, which wasn't really useful. And finally, the per seine fishery was, data was largely inaccessible as well. However, despite all these data limitations, there's hope for the future because things like increased observer coverage, vessel monitoring systems, and cheap tracking technologies all suggest that this data could become available in the future if funds are available. So despite a number of data limitations, the results from my study provide ample material for managers to use moving forward to consider mitigation methods measures to better protect turtles in the bay. So for the vessel strike turtles, research, research has demonstrated that slower vessel speeds is the number one way to reduce lethal sea turtle vessel interactions. But turtles have to travel at speeds less than four kilometers an hour, which isn't very realistic because that's very slow. But using the results in my study, you can avoid minimized travel distance or reduce speed in certain areas where we predict high sea turtle vessel interaction. <coughs> in terms of the fishing data and fishing industry regulations, using these maps, you can prioritize these regulations in time and space where there's an increased likelihood of sea turtle interactions. From a temporal standpoint, we saw differences in the spring peak versus a non-peak period, so rolling regulations could be pursued. And the last thing I want to briefly touch upon is this idea that is the spring peak really indicate that there's higher levels of mortality occurring. So as I mentioned earlier, historically, we have nearly 50% of annual strandings occurring during this two to three week period, but perhaps mortality levels are constant throughout the entire summer. Strandings just aren't occurring as frequently. So to test this, 
I recorded drift time and drift distances of my models. So we have drift time over the year in, on the left and drift distance over the year in the right. And the gray boxes represent the spring peak period. So the results of my decay study suggest that during the spring, cooler water temperatures, turtles are decaying a lot slower. The results of this study suggest that during the spring, turtles are drifting two to five days longer and 10 to 30 kilometers further than during the spring. Both of which suggest that these variabilities and stranding rates between the spring and the summer might be due to other things. So nonetheless, strong protection of turtles throughout their entire residency in the bay is very important. So just to wrap up, the overall purpose of my research is to determine where and how turtles are dying in the bay. Part one was this experimental work to better characterize how a turtle drifts. This included the decay study, which found that turtles are drifting somewhere between two to 15 days, depending on water temperature. We were able to assess the impact of wind forcing, which is somewhere between one to 4%. And then part two, use this experimental data to develop my model. And from that, we were able to, to define predicted mortality locations for vessel strike turtles in the southeast portions of the bay and James River. And the no apparent injuries and unable to assess turtles, mortality was predicted predominantly in the southwest and southeast portions of the bay. And then we also saw differences between the spring peak and non-peak periods. So my research was really one of the first attempts to model predicted mortality locations of sea turtles in Virginia. Similar methods have just recently start to been, have recently start, begun to be adapted in other parts of the world, but my model really has some key model advancements. And that includes this realistic direct wind forcing component. So this drifter study is the first of its kind to try, not surprisingly maybe, first of its kind to try and assess what this wind component of sea turtles is, which is really important. It has a lot of implications for the model. The temperature driven carcass decomposition, there's also probably unsurprising, no results really in the literature on sea turtle decay. So that was one of the first ones out there to do that. And we also developed individual mortality locations for individual strandings and put them all together for our analyses. Despite a number of data limitations, moving forward, future research should really focus on trying to get fishing data more readily accessible so we can conduct more robust analyses and further narrow down this list of potential mortality drivers. But nonetheless, the results from my study provide ample material for a starting point for focused time area management measures. And furthermore, furthermore, the methods in my study are very widely applicable and can be applied to sea turtle strandings and other marine megafauna around the world. With that, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I welcome questions, and I also want to shamelessly plug my publication again, which is focused on the experimental work as well as a second follow-up study that's currently under revision but should come out this year. So thank you for coming. <laughs> um, it was actually in a, a stranding center thing. So they did something not similar, but they did a study where they looked at um, uh, sea turtle carcasses and pound nets and how they're able to get stuck in the nets or get released from the nets. So they used sea turtle carcasses just to try and mimic shape and size. So they came up with the term Franken turtle for that, and then we adapted it for these guys, and then the press loved it. I think that's what made it become as viral as it did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, with your vessel strike data, so you mentioned that two rivers where vessel strikes were most common. Um, was the shipping lane something of concern for vessel strikes? <laughs> Sorry. To repeat the question, um, it was about the vessel strikes and how I showed the map with the. Um, vessel lanes and if those are of concern to the sea turtles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those did correlate predominantly in the Chesapeake Bay. We found the major port areas to be correlating more closely than the shipping lanes in terms of overlap. And that's an area where I would imagine so Yeah, yeah. And it's also the, the, the whole idea that even if you regulate this one area where we said this one sea turtle is dying, it doesn't necessarily mean two feet away from it. Still gonna have the same issue, you know? Yeah. We do have one question online. Uh, they're wondering 
that, from your experience, what percentage of strikes seem to be from larger vessels versus smaller vessels? Um, in other words, how much <coughs> strike risk do you think you're capturing with your AIS model? If you think that would be worthwhile, how would you go about modeling interactions between turtles and smaller vessels? So the question was about the uh, uh, boating data, the vessel strikes, and how we take into account um, smaller vessels versus larger vessels. <coughs> Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. and moving forward, sort of how we can potentially expand research. So that's actually a really interesting point because that was one of the follow-up discussions that if I had more time, I would have liked to pursue. So in our stranding records, the Virginia Aquarium does a great job collecting that type of information, and they're currently doing a QAQC data protocol to see if turtles, based on injuries, they can tell if it's a large vessel or if it's a small vessel that causes mortality. So moving forward, it'd be great to subset those and look at them separately, then also correlate that with vessel strike data separately as well, seeing the turtles that are likely caused by larger vessels and comparing it to large vessel data, and the same for the small vessels. So that's a great question because that is what I wish I would do if I had more time. I think it would maybe also be interesting to look at vessel speed as potentially a mitigation measure, but I'm, I'm wondering with these large commercial vessels, how would they mitigate that? Because <laughs> I imagine they're hard to see. The turtles themselves? The turtles, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I don't know if you've thought anything about Yeah, so the question was about vessel speeds. I think, do you have a comment about that? It goes on to that question. Sure. So they have the seasonal management area off the marine deep marine wells. So it's 10 miles from us for any commercial vessels. So there is that management measure in the same area. Yeah, so the comment was that there is currently a right whale designated area right off Virginia Beach that requires speeds of less than 10 knots an hour for commercial vessels. So that could perhaps be correlated to uh, mitigation me measures for sea turtles as well. Um, vessel speeds is something that's hard to control. And that's, again, another part of the study that if I had more time, I would have liked to look more into the actual realistic actions that could be taken from a management perspective. Um, but we didn't get to go that far, and I'm not, I don't really know too much about what's realistic to do. Yeah. Sorry, that's not useful. <laughs> Any other comments? If not, thank you so much, Bianca, and. <laughs>